Today we have Stephanie Harp here to provide historical context for this month's book, American Atrocity, The Types of Violence and Lynching by Guy Lancaster, with the discussion of John Carter's 1927 murder. As we've seen throughout our discussion over the past few month, months, Carter's lynching had an immediate and long lasting impact on Little Rock and is a harrowing example of the toll racial violence takes on communities. After Stephanie's talk, we'll move to our discussion over the book. Stephanie is a writer and historian based in Maine, whose family ties to Little Rock and elsewhere in Arkansas go back many generations. She holds a master's degree in US history with research focused on lynching, specifically John Carter's murder in 1927. Her work about the Carter lynching has appeared in, in the anthologies Bullets and Fire, Lynching and Authority in Arkansas, and Slavery's Descendants, Shared Legacies of Race and Reconciliation. In 2013, she organized and led the Project 1927 presentation at the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. And she has presented her work at Without Sanctuary, a conference on lynching in the American South at the Arkansas Historical Association and elsewhere. For the 2021 Cal series, Race, Rage and Resistance, she presented John Carter and Lonnie Dixon, Remembering 1927 with Kwame Abdul, Abdul Bey, grand nephew of Lonnie Dixon. I'm going to share a link to that talk on YouTube, and I'll let Stephanie go ahead and get started. Thanks, Danielle. Good evening. Um, I'm going to first give an overview of the complicated series of events that in, involving the 1927 murders of John Carter, Long Dixon, and Floella McDonald, and how they illustrate some points in American atrocity. I'd like to caution viewers that this presentation may contain some trauma triggers for individuals because we'll be discussing structural violence motivated by racial animosity that affects residents of Little Rock, past and present. Because of their ages, I'm sometimes going to refer to Floella McDonald, Glennie Stewart, and Lonnie Dixon by their first names, and John Carter by his surname. In April 1927, everyone was tense and anxious as the great Mississippi Valley flood roared down the Arkansas and Mississippi rivers toward the Delta washing away homes, vehicles, pets, and people. The Arkansas River reached its highest stage since 1833. A Missouri Pacific Railroad bridge collapsed in Little Rock. On April 12th, a young white girl, Floella McDonald, disappeared on her way home from the library during a rainstorm. A young white boy, Lonnie White, was also missing. The city mobilized a search that expanded throughout the state. Six days later, when the Arkansas River overflowed and reached Little Rock, the children were presumed dead. On, on, on Saturday, April 30th, three weeks after she had disappeared, Frank Dixon, the janitor at the First Presbyterian Church at 8th and Scott Streets, found her body in the belfry. He and his 16-year-old son, Lonnie, and seven other African-American men and young men were questioned by police. Little Rock's white-owned newspapers made a point of stating that Lonnie's skin was light. As Guy's book says, minimizing differences like this between groups can increase conflict. After Floella's body was found, Mr. W.R. Kinchlow took his young daughter, Billie Jean, who was either five or eight years old, to police headquarters where someone pointed out Frank Dixon to her. She then picked Lonnie from a three-member lineup. White women and girls identifying a black male perpetrator was a common part of the ritual. When this child's father took her to the station and someone pointed to Frank, you can see that they looked very much alike. She was very likely to follow that lead at eight years old, or especially at five. Billie Jean said Lonnie had promised her a toy at the church, and her parents said it happened the day Floella disappeared. Police then found a bloody set of men's clothes, a common justification in these cases, in a church cabinet and arrested Lonnie for rape and murder. Police Chief Burl Rotenberry and others questioned Lonnie continuously for over 16 hours without letting him rest, eat, or talk to a lawyer. They finally said his mother would be held in jail until he confessed, so he did. Police made a point of saying the confession was voluntary, another ritualized component. The confession said Lonnie had opened a church door for, for Floella to take shelter from the rain, 
been assaulted and killed her. Police said Lonnie led them to an abandoned garage where they found her hat and library book. Police then snuck Lonnie and his father, Frank, out of town as white mobs formed to demand access to them. The mob knew, this is another reference to Guy's book, the mob knew they were an in-group and knew who was not. Note the language in the headline confirming guilt. The Dixon family went into hiding for their safety, but remained in Little Rock and never heard from their father, Frank, again, or learned what happened to him. A group of 2,000 broke into the state penitentiary to search for the father and son, while others searched nearby jails. Angry groups appeared again the next night, attacking the house of the police chief who had left town after threats to his family. Absent law enforcement officers was another common was, was also common in mob violence. On Tuesday, May 3rd, a grand jury indicted Lonnie for assault and murder and warned that more mob violence would not be tolerated. The trial was set for only two weeks later. In 1909, Act 258 had mandated speedy trials and the death penalty for rape in an attempt to prevent lynchings. In a statement, of politicized structural racial violence, Mayor Charles Moyer promised a death sentence for Lonnie. This Arkansas Gazette editorial appealed for law and order, which reinforced the notion that lynchings were a lower class, perceived as a lower class action. Some letters and editorials warned that mob activity would hamper the area's request for help during the flood emergency. The editorial appeared on Wednesday, May 4th. That same morning, Mrs. B.F. Skinner and her year old daughter, Glennie, were driving a wagon toward Little Rock to sell eggs from their farm. A black man reportedly approached them and hear the stories differ widely about what happened next. This account said a car backfired and scared their horse. The man jumped into the wagon to help and the women fell off. Others said he demanded liquor or directions to a bridge and knocked them to the ground. All accounts said a man approached the wagon and both women were injured. The man fled into the woods when a passing car picked up the women and word spread quickly as they told their news on the way to the hospital. The sheriff issued a call for help. The, the more than 1,000 people who gathered to search the area knew their community approved of their group culture of false chivalry of lynching to defend these women. Eight hours later, two officers fired on a man who fled. Then mob members found this man in a tree whom they later identified as John Carter, put him into a car and sent for young Glennie who said, yes, he was the one. Just like Billy, when Billy Jean was at the jail, Glennie's father was among the armed mob. Whether both girls were telling the truth or not, both of them would have known the role they were expected to play. Identifying Carter as assailant dehumanized him. If he had helped the woman, his human impulse of kindness meant the mob wouldn't be able to kill him, and also would mean that he was a threat to the social order and a potential as a potential rival to white men. Mob leaders openly said they wouldn't let police protect him the way they protected the Dixons, making Carter a literal scapegoat. Years later, Lonnie Dixon and John Carter merged in people's memories, conflating the lynching with Floella's death. The mob led Carter to a pole where someone hit him with a revolver and told him to confess, again supposedly voluntarily. When he asked for water, a cigarette, and permission to pray, the mob complied, which let them tell themselves they were being kind to him and their actions were justified. They placed a rope around his neck, threw the other end over a pole, and pushed him into a car onto a car, sorry. Some reports say a handful of officers tried to stop what was happening, but by the mob, meaning the state did not meaningfully intervene, so this violence was political. Someone drove the car out from under Carter and a line of 50 men shot him more than 200 times. Such collective violence dispelled individual guilt. The sheriff later said he was a few miles away and couldn't get there. Yet there'd been time to go back to Little Rock to bring Glenny back out to this country road. When the coroner arrived, no one admitted to having seen the murder, so the death was recorded at the hands of parties unknown. Again, no individual guilt. 
paired here with societal approval. The mob took John Carter's body into town, tied it to a car, and drove down Main Street, past City Hall, stopping at the corner of 9th and Broadway. This was not an accident route or an accidental destination, but both were designed to terrorize Little Rock's African-American community from its thriving heart, known as the Harlem of the South. That corner was home to Bethel AME Church and the national headquarters of the Mosaic Templars of America. The mob placed Carter's body on streetcar tracks, covered it with fuel, piled on boxes, tree limbs, and pews stolen from Bethel, and set it on fire. Decades later, people who had grown up in the church remembered an illustration of the lynching that had hung on the wall. Possibly this dramatization from the Chicago Defender, which captures the spirit of what happened, if not the reported sequence. Some estimated the frenzied white crowd at over 5,000. Rumors that black residents were armed and mobilizing led carloads of armed white men to search houses and businesses. But black leaders, including attorney Scipio Jones, encouraged residents to stay out of sight. Again, white authorities were absent. The mayor and police chief had left town that afternoon, leaving no acting mayor. This would have been in the middle of the search for John Carter that they left town. The assistant police chief wouldn't act without city council. This is politicized collective inaction, which like collective action, deflected guilt from any one individual. Governor John Martineau was in Van Buren. He called out the National Guard and returned to Little Rock. 70 guardsmen converged on 9th and Broadway and dispersed the mob. A Gazette editorial described law enforcement as powerless and brushed aside, but one article agreed, said officers agreed to drag Carter's body through town and burn it, more societal approval. At the riot, someone said, there seems to be no policeman handy, and the crowd laughed, which was a bonding ritual over a shared hatred. Writing 70 years later, a man who had been 15 at the time and hiding in Bethel's basement said the mob included identifiable law, law officers. The sheriff called the, the search and lynching orderly, a justifications of the actions as logical. The melee didn't get out of hand, he said, until the body was dragged to town. On May 5th, the day the lynching and robbery reported in newspapers, Lonnie's trial date was set for May 19th, only two weeks away, confirming the speedy trial idea. In the red box at the top is a thank you from Fluella McDonald's family for support they received during the search for their daughter. In the next column is news about the lynching and riot, which were reported as far away as St. Louis, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and New York. Several reported Carter's age as 22, most said 38. In the 1926 Little Rock and North Little Rock City Directory, there were eight John Carters. In 1927, uh, there was not a, I have not been able to find a directory for 1927. In 1928, there were only four. So they went, it went from four John Carters to eight John Carters in the area. So a confusion in identity is very possible. The Chicago Defenders account said no one had identified Carter and that white men disbanded their search when they heard black citizens were armed. For their coverage, which countered white attempts to restore the social order, the Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier were temporarily, which is another um, African-American newspaper, were temporarily barred from distributing in Little Rock and the Defender's local editor fled the state. Letter writers to the Democrat Gazette debated whether a show of police force would have prevented violence. The mayor said it would have caused more deaths. One unsigned letter to the editor said, quote, there are times when it is necessary to make an example of a Negro to protect our little girls, close quote, which illustrates so many of Guy's points, the in, the in groups and the out groups, the false chivalry and the virtuous violence concept. A grand jury convened to investigate the inaction of law enforcement and city officials. Half the jury refused to indict, the other half resigned in protest and the entire matter was dropped, an act of commonly community approved systemic oppression. The defender questioned the idea of guilt 
to circumvent individual guilt. They have, see the headline and they can't identify this policeman. Two weeks later on May 19th, in a courthouse surrounded by the National Guard, an all white jury took only seven minutes to condemn Lonnie Dixon to the electric chair for Floella McDonald's murder. As a legal lynching, his death was ritualized, systemic and structural violence. Lonnie had made and retracted several confessions. The one he supposedly dictated the night before he died sounds nothing like any teenager, especially one whose family said he could neither read nor write. He was executed on June 24th, his 17th birthday. His age had been reported as 15, 16, or 17, and, and Floella's as 11, 12, or 13. There was some speculation, especially among Black residents, that said that they were perhaps dating. A white boy learned about it, killed her, and flamed, framed Lonnie. Let me go back to this, back to this for a second. If his, you know, someone who's 17 will be dating someone who's 11, but if Floella were 13 and Lonnie were 15, you know, that becomes more plausible. The Chicago Defender reported that a record number of train tickets out of Little Rock were sold to African-American residents after the lynching and riot. Memories of the terror lasted decades. Elizabeth Eckford's mother was a child who saw the cars dragging John Carter's body to 9th Street. This magnified her fear for her daughter's safety at Central High, which had been under construction at the time in 1927. In the 1970s, a different mother feared angry whites would come after her daughter for earning a high school diploma. Marcette Haldeman Julius was a Kansas journalist who was in Little Rock at the time. She and her husband, Emmanuel, published Haldeman Julius Monthly and the Little Blue Book series. Both of these included her reporting about what happened. And in 1929, Simon & Schuster published her novel, Violence, A Tale of Love and Justice in the Central South, based on what happened. This is the Pulaski County Memorial at the Equal Justice Initiative's National Museum for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. John Carter's lynching was the last officially documented in Little Rock, but we don't know how many others died unrecorded. And in June 2021, the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement, in collaboration with the Equal Justice Initiative, installed a memorial marker for John Carter at Haven, and Rest, Haven of Rest Cemetery at 12th Street and Rodney Parham Road, near the site where he died. Co-convener Kwame abdul is Lonnie Dixon's grandnephew. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was really um, interesting. Some of those visuals are hard to look at, but I understand why they're necessary to include. Um, I will stop the recording before we start the actual book discussion, but before I do that, does anyone have any specific questions for Stephanie that we'd like to capture for, for the recording? I have a question. What interested you in this research? Um, my great grandfather was a deputy sheriff at the time and family stories say that he witnessed this. And when I found that out as an adult, I dove into research full force. <laughs> so, yeah, so I have a, I, I have never been able to find documentation. Well, he was, and again, back to the city directory, he was, he's listed in the city directory in 1926 as a deputy sheriff. And he's listed a, with another profession in 1928. And I can't find a 1927 directory. And I haven't been able to locate any, um, Sheriff's records. There was a fire, apparently, you know, and I'm sure as librarians, you know more about this than I do, but um, they're not there. So I have not ever found a list of him. Like, what actual day did he, was he actually on the force that day? Or was he maybe one of the thousands who were deputized or redeputized if he left the force? But in any case, I'd heard the story as a kid and then didn't realize until I was an adult that he was a witness to it. And that was what has driven me into all this research about it. Um, is there anything that you found that was just super surprising or kind of disrupted your preconceived notions of the event? Oh, well, like 
um, as I mentioned, you know, the story I heard was, which it was the two events had got the, the deaths of Lonnie Dixon and, and John Carter kind of all merged together in my family's memory as well. Um, I heard it as they had lynched the man who, who killed the little girl. Um, and that wasn't taken into account Lonnie as a legal lynching. It was, you know, the death of John Carter was connected with the death of Fluella McDonald, which is not actually, you know, directly related. Um, and so that surprised me when I started researching it. It was, you know, it's more complicated than that. It's a very, it's a very intertwined situation because psychologically it is all connected, of course, even though technically they're two separate incidents. Yeah, I think um, we've discussed the Carter lynching a couple of times as it relates to other books we've read um, in the book club. And I think whenever I contextualize it the first time, that is what I said, that it was related to the murder of a young girl in Little Rock. Yeah. Um, because I think that's what I had heard. And so I also sure. repeated that. False that's what most people, well, that's what most people think. But I mean, at the, it's so it was so amazing that at the time, you know, they blatantly said, we're not going to let the po police protect him also, like mm -hmm. he, they protected the Dixons. So they were stating the fact that Carter was a substitute that day at the time. And that was reported in the papers at the time. You know, and then now, as the years have gone by, it's also intertwined. And another really surprising thing was that in all the research, I, I, I did some interviews some uh, of, with some elderly folks. Um, nobody mentioned the flood. I didn't for a long time realize the flood was actually even happening right then. Until I started really looking at the newspapers. Um, but the early research that I did, because people didn't talk about it, the flood. I mean, it was like you would think. <laughs> That, yeah. that would have been a major thing that people would have talked about. Mm -hmm. And these were people who were children at the time, but still you would think it would have been a huge impression. Um, but it, nobody mentioned it at all. Yeah. I guess the the other event sort of trumped it in their collective memory. Well, yeah, matter. sure, sure, sure. Does anyone else have any questions before I stop the recording? Oh, I know what else surprised me. Oh, yeah. I was surprised that that Bethel would have posted a picture of it where children could see it. I mean, I understand that that, you know, I, I don't understand. I mean, I can imagine what some of the reasons would have probably been, but that surprised me a lot when I found out, when I found that out. Because it seems like it would be something they wouldn't want to have up on a wall as a reminder every week. Yeah. That is a lot for a child to have to experience and deal with, for sure. Yeah, and it was folks that told who told me they remembered seeing it as children. Yeah, that you don't forget folks that. growing up in Bethel. Yeah, which would have been years later, you know, mm -hmm. probably because they were not elderly. The folks that I talked with, they weren't old enough to have been children, you know, at the time. Mm -hmm. well, all right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording so we can start the book discussion.